look, first let's define that uh, uh, let's define that uh, the uncertainty indeed is here and something needs to be done. Okay, and I say that because uh, the types of uh, uh, the types of periods whereby uncertainty has been seen in the past, especially after the onset of the Fed put and and so on um, from from the late 90s onwards, uh, are not things that we can rely on as much uh, uh, anymore. So the kinds of shocks that we need to be prepared for. Um, are not necessarily um, recessionary uh, slash, uh, slash deflationary type shocks. We need to start thinking about shocks whereby both bonds and equities are falling together, shocks whereby uh, 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 that, that are linked to rising inflation and, and falling growth. So then the question is, how do you position for that? Right? How do you, how do you uh, protect against that, given that most of the, uh, given the lack of representative data from which we would be we would like to train our, uh, our models, train our understanding of the co-movements of asset classes. You could argue that you can go, can go back to the 70s, but in that particular context, you'd be seeing, uh, you'd be getting a good relationship between bonds and equities, but not necessarily the other asset classes, right? So how do we look at this? Well, first, you need to, you need to introduce a financial market model, so to speak, right? You need to construct a, 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 a framework for looking at how the different macro drivers drive the economy and drive financial markets together, right? A macro model, a macro risk model, right? Which, which we do. And once we do that, you can then start constructing scenario analysis and you can start using uh, statistical tools along the lines of bootstraps, simulated data, and so on to shock basically the different macroeconomic variables. And with that, shock the sensitivity of asset classes and of uh, uh, strategies to those shocks in the macroeconomic variables, right? <clears throat> All of that in the context of scenario analysis, which is different from what we have seen in the past. <clears throat> so how that's that's basically how we we would look at that. And defensive portfolios have a tendency to to do quite well in this kind of uh, framework. Uh, here's a very good example. We've been in. Uh, um, especially the institutional investor community, the asset owner community has been in a, in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, in a situation whereby uh, returns across asset classes are reasonably low, return commitments are high, right? So you have to deliver this kind of level of return, but asset classes are giving this kind of return level, right? You need to do something to get to that. How do you, how do, you do it, right? A lot of what we, uh, uh, we've been seeing, a lot of the push has been to uh, increase exposure to private markets, okay, private credit, private real estate, private equity, and so on, which are asset classes that give you a higher beta that tend to give also arguably a, a, a long-term uh, stronger return. But the, but the problem with that is that capital committed is not the same thing as capital deployed, as capital drawn, right? Mm -hmm. So you can commit capital to a venture capitalist, but the venture capitalist is not going to call your capital immediately because you know they need to find things to invest and, and so on, right? There's a time lag between that. It sits there for a while. It sits there for a while. So what do you do with that boatload of cash that has been committed to something but has not been deployed yet? Not earning. Not earning capital and you need to deliver, uh, you have a certain uh, return target that you need to match, right? We have been looking at uh, private equity and private market return substitution solutions mm -hmm. using uh, uh, public securities, which you can access quickly, you can remove quickly, and at the same time, they, produce, they provide uh, uh, returns whose tracking error to, uh, to uh, uh, private, uh, private capital is, uh, is quite low. The tracking error is quite low. In other words, it does a very similar job to, uh, to that. So that's a good example of other types of solutions that we're looking at at the moment. One of the topics, right, so to speak, just as inflation, is important, uh, uh, ESG is important, and, and these are the structural types of uh, uh, topics that we've seen, uh, um, that we've seen in, in recent history. And we've gone, through a, uh, we've gone through a certain chronology, right? It started with how to define the, the term, how to define sustainable investing and ESG and so on. So then uh, how to construct metrics that reflect that definition. So then assess whether uh, those metrics, once you translate them into returns, give you an uncorrelated, unique type of factor, or whether it's just a manifestation of other factors, right? And then from there, the final step is how to introduce that into portfolios, how to put that in portfolios, right? Uh, <clears throat> there have been 
uh, further advancements on uh, 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 basically investors going inside each of the each of the pillars of ESG. More recently, the environment pillar, right, uh, uh, and, uh, and and doing some fine tuning there. But in terms of portfolio allocations, and more importantly, um, the, the exact shape of of of, of uh, 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 the exact shape in which this translates into portfolio construction. Uh, it, the tools are more or less similar to what we've seen before, right? So you've got, you've got um, uh, negative screening, you've got integration, and you've got standardized tilting of positions such that you can then uh, uh, reach, try to reach a certain ESG goal. But here's a, here's a point that we don't often think about, but we find out once we're, once we're doing the exercises, right, of portfolio construction with, with ESG. You may have a portfolio that is already tilted correctly to what you wanted, but then once you add ESG, those tilts, they go off, right? You may start getting biases towards regions or sectors, or more importantly, factors, investment factors, investment styles that you wouldn't have necessarily thought about and maybe you don't want. The most notable of those, especially over the past, uh, of the past well, more than a year now, uh, uh, your short value. Your short companies that are cheap, you tend to have a negative exposure to companies that are cheap and a positive exposure to companies that are expensive, which has not been a great trade to be short value over the past year and a half, right? It's, it's, it's a factor that has done quite well. So it's, f more, it's further important, right? It's also important to make sure that uh, these uh, uh, excess biases, as they come in, that they also get controlled in portfolio construction and it's, it's, it's something that, uh, while at the same time maintaining the, the ESG targets of, of the portfolio, and that's something that we've done active research on.